those videos. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ian for attending the invitation, Amy and uh, Alberto uh, it and helped to set this uh, workshop in White Flight Taxonomy, which we started yesterday. No, the the AFAS and the Puerto Rico and the Department of Agriculture, the Florida, this Department of Agriculture Customer Service that will support you and the collaboration that we have, this experimental station, Luis on the library that is putting together this and putting this online. Uh, uh, Administration here that support me as well. Uh, this is the place that we have I'm, uh, here. I am an entomologist uh, at the division of plant industry and in the government service uh, uh, for the department, the local government service, and uh, is a uh, curator of Coxidia of Arvida in the Chaudera uh, at the museum in the collection of Arthropods. That is one of the main, if it's not the main uh, collection of arthropods of uh, uh, tropical regions that, that we have in the world. We have the pleasure to have him here. We have the past for the colleagues from that same collection. We always will be able to receive. Uh, Dr. Stark received his, his PhD in entomology at the University. And, and join the API and is the creator of uh, the collection. Uh, he he, he started uh, his work in 2010 and specialized in scales, smelly bats, and white flies, and participated in many of these teaching workshops and tests that we really able to have him here. We went yesterday, you guys have all the, the agenda of the, the activities. Uh, we, went, we went to the field yesterday. We have fresh material we will be processing uh, today. Uh, we will have lectures uh, here uh, tomorrow. And we will have, I, mean, I hope, a very productive uh, week uh, talking dedicated to white flies. As of all, it's really a privilege for us, for the white flies, and for everyone else. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Good morning. Um, also, good morning to the uh, remote audience. Uh, I hope that um, uh, by going through this presentation, discussing some things, that you'll uh, have a, a, a slightly improved or enhanced understanding of, of white flies and the issues that they cause and the uh, ways that we have of identifying them. Um, so I'm very glad to be here in, 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 in PR. I was in the Caribbean last year in Grenada for a workshop. I very much enjoyed that. I'm, very much enjoying being here so far and looking forward to the rest of the week. Um, and uh, Jose indicated that um, me in my current position, I'm just one of the latest in, in a number of, uh, of, of entomologists in Florida that have had a, a long relationship with um, especially Puerto Rico at the state level, um, also in our interactions with um, the, the federal government, the USDA. Of course, Puerto Rico is a, a very important um, part of the of the United States in, in terms of the trade between the Caribbean and, and Florida, the movement of people and products back and forth. And that's the source of some of the issues that we have with, with agriculture and horticulture and the movement of pests. So we're going to focus on white flies uh, um, in, uh, in coordination with the project that um, Alberto has been working on for identifying potential pest white flies uh, that could be moving through the trade and, and are here in Puerto Rico. Um, so there's a slight change from the handout you have to the one that we're going to go through. I've added a few slides, um, uh, but uh, an updated uh, printout will be available um, for you to use. So just a general outline. We're going to discuss some of the, the, the biology uh, of white flies. Uh, a very important thing for the people especially involved in the technology aspect of, of, of the science identification uh, what are the resources uh, available? Um, move into a little bit of the taxonomy, um, help us get a better understanding of, of uh, how to recognize the different groups of white flies and some of the more important species. Uh, 
have some time for questions at the end, specifically for questions, but if, if there's something that was not clear when we discuss it here, you can put your hand up and, and uh, I'll try to answer it. Uh, and then I've also concluded with um, a list of uh, literature resources that are particularly important for, for a lifelike uh, taxonomy, emphasizing especially a, a worker who unfortunately just recently retired, uh, John Martin. He was one of the major contributors to our current understanding of, of life lives of, of the neotropics especially. So to discuss some of the biology. Um, White flies are not unique, but they're certainly um, uh, very interesting from a taxonomic uh, point of view, a biological point of view, from the fact that the states you typically encounter when you're doing surveys or when commodities are moving through an inspection area, the stage you encounter is one of the immature stages. Uh, and that, in fact, is the basis for the taxonomy for almost all of the white fly species. Um, almost always, that immature stage will be adhered to the leaf surface. Uh, we'll discuss this a little bit more, but uh, they're almost never found on fruit, flower, bark, uh, just the leaf surface itself. The diagnostic stage, the one that you prepare as a slide, the one you examine under a microscope, is the pupa. This is also known as the puparium, which is a word that we typically use um, in discussing the, uh, the metamorphic stage of, of flies, which have a genuine metamorphosis. What white flies go through is, is similar to that, but it's, it's, it's substantially different. The adult insect matures inside of the cuticle of the fourth stage. Okay, so even though you're looking at the morphology of the pupa, inside of that is some part of the developmental stage of the adult itself. Okay? So from a biological point of view, they all start as eggs. Okay? A lot of scales and mealybugs um, are actually born live. All white flies lay eggs. Uh, the first stage, um, you call it a first stage larva, or a, uh, excuse me, or a crawler, this is the primary dispersive stage for white flies on the substrate. Okay, they have legs, antennae, they have the capacity to move on the leaf. Once they settle down at that stage and molt into the second stage, they are then sessile. They will never move again throughout their immature life. So they molt to a second, third, and then formally the fourth stage in which the change to the adult occurs. Through these stages, they get a little bigger. They acquire more of their characters on the cuticle, the, the body itself, um, and the, the pattern of wax production may change. And then, of course, they molt. They erupt from the cuticle of the pupa as a male or a female, and they have wings so they can fly. Uh, they're typically not very good flyers, but they can disperse. One of the problems we encounter in the taxonomy of certain white fly groups is there can be changes in the body shape and characters of the body that are related to the substrate, the leaf that they're on. So the most common example is crawlers um, that settle on a hairy leaf may develop a lot more seedy on their body, so they'll kind of look hairy themselves. Ones that develop on a, on a hairless leaf, a smooth leaf, they may be correspondingly smooth in their body as well. And they can have changes in their body outline. Um, I mentioned the males can fly, males and females fly and mate, but they're very weak flyers, they're very small, so they typically don't fly very far. White flies, especially in tropical conditions or greenhouse conditions, can have extremely rapid generation time. The cycle from egg to adult female back through can be very, very quick. So populations can build up in the appropriate circumstances very, very rapidly. One of the other problems, other than rapid generation time, is there's a tremendous amount of variation in uh, the species relationship with potential host plants. A few species of white flies are uh, what we call monophagous, or very host-restricted one species or a few related species. And then some species of white flies are extreme polyphages. Um, the host list for Bamesia is hundreds and hundreds of species of plants for many, many different groups of plants. So there's a wide range of, of, of the 
potential hosts for a lot of these species. A major consequence of their feeding is their ejection of the honeydew. So they take in more, more water and more carbohydrates than they can use, so they eject that as a syrupy, sticky liquid called honeydew. This then becomes a substrate for molds. There's a variety of molds we call sooty molds. They use that as a substrate, and eventually they cover the fruit, the leaf, or anything around it um, in a black kind of powder. Uh, and of course, for, for fruit, um, that can damage quality for shipping and commercial things. It can interfere with plant productivity. Many white flies, in part because of their rapid generation time, develop um, quite quickly resistance to chemicals. Uh, this has been a major problem, especially with greenhouse pests. This rapid generation time, the recombination of genetics, it, you know, which is basically evolving resistance to new types of antibiotics, uh, to new types of control products. I mentioned earlier, they're almost exclusively on the leaf. Um, and most of the time, though not exclusively, it does vary with circumstance, they are on the ab axial, what's called ventral lower surface of the leaf. So one that typically is not going to be the most exposed to sun or the most, you have to kind of flip the leaf over. Some species, especially when the, the, the populations become very high, they'll settle wherever they can, including the top of the, the, top of the leaf. Uh, and I mentioned they rarely are on fruit, stem, and flower. Uh, not all species. So white flies are, are, are very well known for the production of wax, but not all species do that. Some of the most um, serious pest species, in fact, make no wax at all. Um, some of the citrus pests, the citrus white fly, um, is essentially a clear species. It's very hard to see on the leaf. And some of the major greenhouse pests also are very well blended in with the background, and they don't produce much wax. A good thing to look for in the field for scouting um, is the presence of, of egg spirals or circles. These are made by the females when they land on a leaf. Um, they'll use uh, special structures on their abdomen to secrete wax in a spiral or circular pattern, and they'll deposit eggs in that. Okay, so that's a good signal that the plant is uh, being at least visited by white flies. Viruses, um, white flies, like aphids, um, are, uh, at least for some species, extremely good at transmitting viruses. Um, this is not an area of, of deep knowledge for me, but to summarize it, um, a, a Jones in 2003 surveyed uh, and, and uh, synthesized the, the literature on virus transmission in white flies. About 114, I'm sure that number is even bigger now, 10 years later, virus species have been identified as moving through white fly populations. 90% of those are in the genus uh, Begamovirus. Uh, but Mesia tabansi alone, um, there's evidence for over 100 species of viruses that it can transmit. Um, the good thing is, though, is uh, white flies either do or have the capacity to respond very well to an integrated pest management uh, program, especially involving biocontrols. Uh, their entire uh, groups of microparasitic wasps that specialize exclusively on white flies and are also predators that are either generalist or specific on white flies. Um, so uh, parasitic wasps, certain lady beetle groups, and of course um, uh, lacewing beetles, uh, lacewing insects, the chrysopus. Uh, so uh, uh, the more knowledge we have of the ecology, what species involved, the better chance we have of, of using um, natural elements of the, the, the natural cycle to, to help solve our problems. I just quickly want to go over some of the resources that are particularly important for the New World, especially in the tropics. One of the problems we face with white flight taxonomy is that um, there, there are issues with um, having good single resources that compile very widespread information. Uh, it's, it's widespread in time. A lot of the literature goes back to the early part of the 1900s. Uh, it's very often in a variety of languages. A couple of the major authors were publishing in Portuguese, Brazil, but it's actually, a, linguistically, it's a, it's a form of, of Portuguese that even most modern speaking Portuguese speakers have a hard time understanding. Um, like I said, it's not consolidated, it's, it's all over. Uh, there are quality issues, illustrations, diagnosis. 
And overall, there's some limitations to the utility as a, as a, as a piece of technology, a tool for identification. For the new world, the major uh, publishers um, were uh, Rario Bandar and Adolfo Pimpel from Brazil. They did most of their work in, in Brazil. Uh, and the pair of publishers, uh, Quaintance and Baker, uh, do a lot of work for uh, the U.S., Mexico. Um, another important worker for several groups is Russell, Louise Russell. She was at the, uh, the uh, Smithsonian Museum for, for many decades. Um, so these are names that pop up repeatedly in, in our taxonomy. I mentioned John Martin. He's recently retired. And he was, he was the world expert for an entire group of white flies that is, is uh, most predominant in the neotropics. Um, my counterpart in the USDA for the identification services of, of USDA is Greg Evans. And he's, he's one of the best white fly taxonomists in the world. Two other people recently left um, on uh, the white fly identification world, Ray Gill from California and uh, John Dooley from, uh, from APHIS. There are a few catalogs that appear to consolidate at least the, some of the, the, the most relevant information. Um, it is now being maintained by Greg Evans, um, primarily, but with um, with Mam and Kali uh, in uh, in Asia. This is an unpublished PDF, and you can contact if you want a copy of it. You can probably contact Greg Evans directly to get a copy because I have one that's now a couple of years old, but it is still unpublished. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to spend any time on here, but these are the ones that you will kind of need to have at your disposal in, in order to identify, um, and especially for Martin, John Martin's literature on the subfamily Aelirodexonomy. Just to back out where we are in taxonomy, so we're in the uh, in the group known as the uh, the Sternorinka. This is the group that's coordinate with the group Alcanorinka, which is mainly the hopper groups. So the sternorinka, they're the ones that are characterized primarily by having the mouth parts opening around on this part of their body as opposed to around this part. So the mouth parts essentially move down the body quite a bit. Uh, there are the three major groups here are the uh, apigoidea, the siloidea, and the cupoidea, the, um, uh, and the aliroidea. The apigoids are, of course, a, a very large group. Siloids, not so, not so large. The coidea, of course, very important also. The single family in the superfamily Aliroidea uh, is just the white flies itself. And it's actually surprisingly small, only about 1,600 species worldwide. I'm sure it's quite a bit larger than that, but it's even small compared to the scale groups. Uh, there are two subfamilies, the Aliroidine, which is by far the largest group, uh, 1,450 species. It is worldwide in distribution. And then the much smaller group, Aliroidine, these are some of the more um, easily observed ones when you go out and, and do surveys in, in, in environments because they're generally larger, uh, easier to see, produce more wax. And it is substantially a new world group. So there are some species that are described from or probably thought to be uh, native to other parts uh, of the world, but primarily neotropics. And then a, a, this isolated subfamily here which is, is, is still very uh, very poorly understood, but is a South American endemic. So for the identification of white flies, um, to get a species name on something, um, there's almost no way around it has to be slide mounted. Uh, generally speaking, we go through this process where we clear the contents, we treat the cuticle, um, either to lighten it or to put some stain in it. This helps enhance characters. We observe it under the microscope. And then we compare it to um, illustrations um, that appear for the key or the diagnosis. The illustration on the right is a very generalized illustration of a white fly. Um, as it is with the scale groups, the convention for illustrations is that the characters that are on the ventral surface are on the left side of the drawing. And those on the dorsal surface are on the right side of the drawing. So no white fly is going to have all those characters there. It's actually kind of nice if they did, because there would be more to look at. Um, some white flies have almost none of those characters. 
and some of those characters are restricted to certain groups, okay, the subfamily level. But by and large, this is the kind of landscape that you'll need to appreciate uh, and compare against when you examine the specimen under the scope. So that other slide was of a pupa. As I said before, is the stage that we uh, do process, we do identify. Um, from a, a, a broad taxonomic point of view, at least for identification, the adults are, 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 they just don't have much value. The taxonomy is based on the pupa. The adults uh, are less often encountered. They're difficult to prepare, get oriented, so you can appreciate even the characters that we do think have value for their taxonomy. So by and large, um, we don't base any identifications on the adult stage. It is nice to collect them when available, especially if you're able to get genetic data from them, because you can always come back to that specimen later and work with it further. The characters that are important, though, um, uh, and that you can use occur on the ovipositor of the female, so the structures that she uses for laying the eggs. Corresponding uh, structures on the male, the clasters that are used um, in mating. The antennae, of course, part of their sensory apparatus are very important, have a lot of characters on them. And then the pattern of seeding on legs uh, is very variable um, and can be used in some instances for determining species, but we don't have enough information for all of the species to make it a generally useful tool. The first thing that you're going to be sort of tasked to do when identifying a white fly is to put it in the right subfamily. And so we have the two subfamilies, Aelirodocyne and Allerodyne. They're actually very easy to tell apart. You've got a slight amount of pupa. Aelirodocyne, the legs, which is in all the deep groups are very, very small, stubby legs. Um, the adult, the, 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 the leg of the uh, Aelirodocyne, they have a claw. Okay? The end of it is a very obvious hook-shaped claw. The Allerodyne, they don't. They have a, it's basically a terminal pad. It's an adhesive pad. It's a circular in structure, and they use that for adhering to the leaf. The Aelirodocyne, a structure called the lingula, uh, which is in a posterior part of the body. It will always have two pairs of seed coming off of it. Okay? Those are almost always the easy to see, um, and, and that's not the condition for the, the Allerodyne. Um, the Aelirodocyne, they have structures called compound pores. Because most of them do, a few, a few instances they're missing. These are very complex structures that produce wax uh, on the uh, on the on the pupa. But they, like I said, they are absent to some species. Allerodine don't have pores of the compound type, but they do sometimes have dorsal glands, but they don't have anything like the complexity of structure you find in the aleurodicine. So here's some illustrations of those structures. They said it's just for Allerodine, it's just a circular pad. The Allerodine is a simple hook. In the middle, you can see just how complex these structures are. The top two illustrations in those three are looking down on top. So you can see they have many subregions and outer ring, inner ring, chambers. Um, and then that's at the bottom what they look like inside you. Okay, so all of all of those chambers inside that compound core are involved in some way with secreting a type of wax. The last uh, pair of illustrations on the posterior margin, on the dorsal surface, uh, the major structure is the vasiform orifice. Okay, it's, it's, it's an opening, usually of some uh, circular, oval, or sub, sub-triangular shape. And most of that opening is filled by a lip like uh, uh, a lid-like structure called the operculum. Okay? And then sticking out from that is the structure called the lingula. All of those three structures together form what we know as a honeydew flipper. So honeydew is secreted out onto that, and then they can flip it. Okay? So you see these, sometimes you see watches happen, little jets of honeydew being flipped out. And that, of course, that helps get rid of uh, away from the body. Um, and you can see uh, uh, one, uh, two pair of seed at the tip of the, the lingula from there, and there's, there's a one pair of seed at the bottom um, of the elioid dining here at the bottom.
For the subfamily Allerodini, there's a great diversity of, of wax production, body shape, body color, degree of, of, of hardening of the cuticle. So we have something like Crenidorsum here. Uh, it's a very pretty fringe of, of white wax, and that's essentially all that it makes. Um, Aleoroclatus here is a, is a, a good sized genus. Makes this wonderful glassy wax coming out. It's very clear, very glassy like. With um, this species, it's got three uh, thin pencils of white wax. Each one of those pencils on the side is coming from the opening to the scapular. Um, uh, there's a, a groove there that opens up the gas exchange. Wax is produced there. Um, one that has not compound pores, but glands that secrete wax on the dorsum is aleoglandulus. Big tubes of clear wax come out, very dramatic looking. And then essentially a wax-free pupa, like the citrus white fly. Um, these are a few examples of what they look like slide mounted. Oh, sorry, um, just to back up one. Now, um, when you had the difference between the two um, subfamilies, mm -hmm. um, you said for the allobrodyne, uh, lingula without terminal seeding, but then in the picture... Yeah, that's correct. That's a typo. Oh, okay. Yeah, it should be, there's one pair for the okay. Okay. Yeah, that's how it was like, like that, was, that was a typo. Yeah. Um, so these are three uh, slide-mounted pupae here. Uh, the one on the left is a very common one. We encountered it yesterday. This is the woolly white fly, Aleurothrypsis, common on citrus, uh, copaloba, uh, a variety of things. Uh, one in the middle, I put that there because it's one that has uh, uh, very pronounced structures coming off of the dorsum. They're, they're almost a, a, a tube-like structure. Um, they look a lot like the spiny white flies, um, but when you see them on the leaf, they look and they're actually very different. Those tubes produce a kind of a, uh, a ball of sticky wax. So it's almost like a little ice cream cone with the wax on the top. Uh, and then the one at the very bottom there, is um, Cingiella simplex, the ficus white fly. This is one, like the citrus white fly, that produces essentially no wax. So exploring a little bit more detail, the morphology and a higher magnification of a given specimen, you might see things like this. Again, the ficus white fly. Um, the pattern of bumps, creases, wrinkles, what we basically call the, the, uh, the particular structure is very variable and can be very informative. So you look at the derm, the evaluate the condition of that. Um, a major structure uh, uh, on the posterior region from the basiform orifice to the actual margin itself is the caudal furrow. Okay, this is another kind of uh, clearance structure for the animal, like the two at the front, the thoracic furrows that allow for uh, gas exchange. Uh, these have characteristic lengths, widths. The inside have characteristic um, cuticular structures that can either be spines or bumps or plates. So a lot of structure there. Again, the shape of the vasiform or uh, orifice, the shape, the shape of the operculum, um, and seed that surround it. A lot of species have very modified seed. This species is characterized by having a seed that's shaped almost like a little bit of a feather. Okay? You almost don't have to see anything else. If you see that seed, you've got ficus white fly. Um, and then the thoracic furrow, uh, again, the interior of that, but also at the margin, it forms very often a kind of a comb-like structure. And the number of teeth, how long they are, the shape, those can be very important as well. This is what a white fly like Cingiella looks like um, uh, at different stages of development on the leaf. Again, I said this is one that doesn't produce much wax. The top left is um, a, a second or third stage right there. So it's, it's, it's not a crawler shape anymore. It's now sessile on the leaf. The top right is a pupil stage, but it's early in that pupil stage. The reason I can tell it's a pupa is it's got those red eyes there. Okay, those are structures that are associated with the developing adult inside. So this is the early stage of its development. Bottom uh, left, that's quite a bit further along in its development. 
And then at the bottom right is what happens when the adult is fully developed and emerges. The cuticle has a, 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 a line that goes down the middle, and then a pair of lines go on, on each side to the margin. Those are the sutures that break to allow the adult to get out of the skin. So that's a very common condition to find a pupa on a leaf. Um, you can see all those uh, opaque white spots on the dorsal surface of an infected ficus leaf. A situation like this, the, the populations are so high that they, you know, you'll find plenty of them on the, on the dorsal surface. And then for us in Florida, when this uh, fly, white fly, started uh, really becoming abundant, um, literally thousands and thousands of miles of ficus hedges, millions and millions and millions of dollars of, of landscape investment, just shed its leaves, flush out, shed its leaves, and eventually just went downhill. Fortunately, like I said, we have a lot of beneficials to assist us in our fight here. This is one that we would find in association with. Um, now, this is a subfamily that, for me, is the most interesting. Uh, this is the Aelia dicyne, and you can see already just a snapshot of some of the species. Um, uh, there's just there's quite a bit more morphological diversity in this group. Some very interesting structures that look, I think, actually look, look, look quite beautiful when they're slide mounted. Uh, there's a very large genus, uh, Iliodicus, that we now have a much better understanding of after the work of Martin fairly recently. So these, um, these three genera here um, are the uh, you most likely to encounter these uh, just out of the general environments. And uh, they go by a variety of common names. Some are called spiraling, some are called giant nesting. Um, though giant white flies um, are, are usually what we call all of the species down here in the because they're all quite large. The genus Metal Eurydicus, um, worldwide, we know of 11 species. We know that we have three here. One is very host restricted, the other are more or less um, uh, polypagus. Um, Parallel erodes. This is a very interesting genus. We, we know we've got six species here. Uh, it's, I, I think it's a very challenging, taxonomically very challenging group to identify. Um, and I'm especially excited for, for maybe when we get some molecular data, get some nice slides for comparison, we can start um, improving our understanding of this group. Uh, and then this genus, uh, Iliodicus. Uh, this has turned out um, periodically to have species that are major pests. Um, the original, quote, spiraling white fly um, uh, that was uh, described from Florida was for a period a very significant pest of a wide variety of plants. The giant white fly, um, when it became established in uh, California, had a massive impact on a lot of plant species there. Then it kind of hopscotched its way into Florida and became a major problem for hibiscus. Um, and now, about four years ago, we picked up another spiraling white fly in Florida. Um, we called it the ghost spiraling white fly. It's a major pest of palms, gumbo limbo, a few other plants that are very common in landscapes. And they produce not only a tremendous amount of stress on the plant, but extraordinary quantities of wax and honeydew. Any question? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the slide book. And our handouts, those two. The oh, yes, yeah, I'm sorry. That's a, um, when I rearranged the slide, I forgot to uh, change. Um, so this one at the top here, that one is not, that's, okay, that's so metal we'll urodicus. Yeah, yeah, that's changed what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Our handouts are right. Yeah. yeah. For those uh, that were in the field yesterday, um, we saw this on the top left quite a bit on a number of plants. This is a very, characteristic sort of wandering, meandering spiral pattern that can be up to as large as a quarter in diameter, um, the, the pattern that they form. And very often you'll see an adult female sitting in the middle of that. She's the one that will have made that pattern. Um, so that's a good signal to look for uh, on plants. I mentioned the, the, the giant white fly, uh, Aeliorhipus dejezii. This is a picture from when it was at the infestation stage um, um, a number of years ago in California, all of that is wax dripping down from the leaf. 
Similar, though not quite as dramatic, is the effect of the rugose fire on the white fly hat in Florida. That's the infested undersurface of a palm. And this is a shot of a car that may have been under that palm, under a gumbo limbo. Um, all of that white stuff there is uh, wax, uh, honeydew. It was getting on cars, sidewalks, furniture. Uh, people were actually having motors on their pump systems for their pool burn out because it was having to take out so much wax and, and the bodies of all the adults that it was actually just a clock and shut down. So we started seeing a lot of this in the field, you know, we had that PV on the, on the leaf surface and we had, uh, eventually started seeing a lot more of what we see on the left here, top left, evidence of parasitism in the population. This is a good thing to look for when you're out in the um, uh, out in the field scouting populations. If you see a, an irregular hole chewed in the top there, that's the emergence of the parasitic wasp um, that has developed inside of the uh, inside of the white fly. You also see a lot of the adults. Uh, the females are quite large. They're you know in excess of a, a millimeter or a couple of millimeters long. Sometimes they have patterns on the wings. And with a hand lens, you can easily tell the males from the females. Uh, the males of this genus in particular have very long, what we call clasper structures. Those are used in mating. They protrude from the end. Under a compound scope of a mounted stain um, specimen, this is a kind of uh, uh, view you would have. Uh, we'd evaluate how many of these compound pores are along the margin, uh, what their relative size is, what the distribution of associated pores would be, um, and the shape of the basiform orifice, the operculum, and the lingula is all very variable. And um, in some cases, you don't even need to see the rest of the animal. All you need to do is take a look at that basiform orifice and its structure, and you know which species you're looking at. But there are a large diversity of pore types uh, in this genus, especially and they occur in varying combinations and distribution patterns and all of those are, are, are quite well mapped out in, in identification literature. This is the other genus that's important, uh, Metalluridicus. Um, you have all three of these species here. In Florida we have only the two at the top. Uh, we have what's called Cardin's white fly. This can be an occasional intermittent pest of, of guavas. Um, usually by the time I see a sample of an infested guava, the population has been hit by the wasps and it's gone somewhere else. So it's a past tense problem. Um, but it can build up very high numbers until the parasitoids get there. Uh, Metaluridicus grisius is, is restricted essentially to the genus Eugenia. Um, I actually don't ever see it out in the field. Um, only a patient get it in the samples. And then um, another species that I got in the collections from Alberto was uh, Metaliridicus uh, minimus, uh, which we can find on citrus and a few other plants. Um, adults in this genus um, characteristically have a pair of dark spots in the wings. Uh, and they're actually one of the smaller of the species. Well, the specimens are actually some of the smaller um, uh, species in, 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 in the uh, Alio dysonia, that's quite small. Also reasonably small, but not quite as small as is the nesting white flies, parallelirodes. Um, we know that we, well, we think we have these six species here. Um, we could have any, uh, more species at any time. These things travel very well. Um, they pop up on hosts that we may not have expected when we get into a new environment. When we got uh, first records of Paralyrodes fungari a few years ago was on Ficus. Okay? Um, Ficus is not a reported host of any significance for the entire genus. Uh, Mimei and Citriculus are well associated with citrus. Both of those have moved around. Um, this was a very challenging group for me. The nature of these compound pores is very important for species identification, um, but it can be hard to assess. Some of the uh, resources are, are deficient for this group, taxonomic resources. So again, I'm very excited to get some of the specimens associated from, from work here and elsewhere. The reason it's called nesting 
is the pupa, when it's sitting on the leaf. Of course, it's producing wax from all those compound pores. It's very long, glassy, and kind of spaghetti-like, but it breaks off. And when it breaks off, it kind of falls to the side and forms an irregular sort of circle of this wax, um, forming almost like a nest. Um, the females also look like they're nesting when they land because they produce that spiral. Um, but that's the, it's the, the wax that falls off of the pupa is the, is the reason for giving it the name nesting. Shortly after this species became established in Florida, um, this is what we were observing. When we found ficus trees, especially Benjamina trees, um, that had not been defoliated from the ficus white fly, we were finding the remaining leaves utterly covered with wax and honeydew. Um, so this was a very common sight. And then, of course, they were going to lose their leaves all over again. So this was a real problem for, uh, for, for homeowners. Um, there's a picture of it uh, on the leaf. They're forming the very complicated uh, wax structure. Is it a crawler at the top? The what? Is it a crawler at the second? The on the top? Oh, yes. There's an adult female. And then uh, another crawler or the egg. Here, I think it's the egg. Yeah. So she would basically sat there and, and turned around in a circle, um, hugging those eggs. Okay. All right. Um, so I think we have we have room for questions. Um, I also want to mention for the people that are going to be doing laboratory work, um, kind of a little bit of the manual, so to speak, that we'll have. Um, but first, if, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to take them. Um, so if uh, if visually you see a lot of wax, um, one can assume you would find a, a lot of robust compound pores then? Yeah, yeah. Especially if the wax looks irregular. Um, the allyrhodines, when they're producing wax, it, it seems to have m much more of a definite kind of structure and composition to it. It's more sort of orderly, so to speak. It can look very scruffy for the allyrhodicine. Um, but the woolly, woolly to me sounds like it had a lot of wax, but it was in the other group, right? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a different, that's an, that's an exception there. It's a very, um, it's it's also a very scruffy kind of wax. And we saw that yesterday in the field. Um, one of the things you'll notice with that is that um, very often you'll see, I don't know if it's just water or honeydew, but globules of liquid sort of enmeshed in that, that, that proliferation of wax. And then... Shortly thereafter, it starts acquiring the sooty mold. So it's very very common to see um, a patch of, say, a cocoa leaf or a citrus leaf that just looks like it's been spray painted with black paint. And that's all the sooty mold that's now growing on wax and honeydew. So that one will have a lot of compound pores? It doesn't have compound pores, no. It's a very, very fine, simple wax, mostly just long fibers that curl up. Um, the, the compound pores for the aliodicines, that's actually structurally a very complex um, fiber. Um, it's got many parts to it, and each part is, a con is contributed to by a, a different subregion of that compound pore. They do produce a lot of the simpler pores, too, from make it structurally more simple pore types. Those can be around the margin. Um, or some species, they can be distributed over the dorsum as well. But most of that wax. Um, comes from pores that are restricted to the abdomen on the margin, or pairs um, right at the front uh, uh, near the anterior margin. There are uh, any pattern to egg layer for these species? Or no? no, not that you would be able to rely on in any way in the field. Uh, you can develop an eye for um, as we were seeing yesterday in the field, some of those spiraling white flies, they were, first of all, they were fairly large in the extent of that wax pattern, and then some of them were fairly meandering. Um, that is a spiraling white fly pattern. But um, when it comes to looking at, say, you know, different species that you might find on a citrus leaf of the potential white flies citrus, um, by and large, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to use any information about that to determine what possibly the white flies are. 
Um, so the crawling stage, uh, how far do the crawlers go? Will they stay on the same leaf? Will they go very far on a different branch? I don't know really of much empirical work. I'm saying it's not there. Um, I don't know that personally. Uh, I would doubt that they would move, um, say, when they hatched from the egg that was put on the leaf, I would doubt that they moved um, off of that leaf. Um, I don't think they really would negotiate their way to bark, you know, down the petiole, onto the stem, whatever, onto the leaf. Uh, I don't know that that's not true, but I would find it, it, it seems a difficult task to work. Yeah, most of the most of the, the dispersal um, from one part of an infested plant, so female lands, her eggs hatch, you see the, the pupae developing on a leaf, um, moving to another part of the plant, that should be accomplished primarily by the female. So that's that's probably partly why you see when you see infested um, plants, you see there's a leaf that's infested here. Leaves that's infested there. Those are probably all found in females that are that were positive on that one. Um, new world species versus old world species. It seems like the waxy ones tend to be the new world species. Is that pretty indicative that you know, we're seeing the movement of pests? You know, you're seeing the waxy ones kind of say they're probably coming from the new world and the non waxy ones from the old world? Yeah. Um, that, that entire subfamily, Eleodoxyne, uh, it looks to be a, a good division as well. Um, uh, uh, is very, very heavily dominated, a little bit dominant in, in the New World tropics. There are species that have been described from other regions of the world. Um, some of those are probably things that had moved, become established, were discovered for the first time in that, in that, uh, uh, that new province and described. Um, but there appear to be some that, that, that probably are actually endemic to other biogeographic regions. Um, but certainly that subfamily, for the most part, is speciated, modern speciation has, has been um, in the tropics. And they do have a very significant propensity to want to move around. They like to be on plants that are important in uh, commercial trade, especially uh, ornamentals and uh, Fruit producing species. Um, so that's so probably how they do it. In morphology? Is the female the only one that comes in this No, I, uh, the males have structures on them that are the same as the females in the, in the way that they produce the wax. So that's a good question. I, I don't think the males deposit any wax. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think so. To morphological identification of PP, it's necessary to clarify, clarify, use the clear the specimen. Yeah, Yeah, there, there, there are a number of species, uh, but if you if you have a given region that you're studying. You have an idea what species are there, and you see them on the leaf. You can say, "Oh, yeah, it's that species," just by looking at it, um, and and be right probably 99% of the time. Um, if you're right 100% of the time, so to speak, you have to slide that. So you have to clear it. Um, you have to get out the body contents, which is uh, the muscle tissue, basically the proteins and fats um, that are inside the body. You have to get rid of all of that. The only thing that remains is the cuticle. Um, now. And one of the things that we're going to talk about in, in our protocol and, and, and lab work is some of the species are very dark, very dark brown or black. Um, they have to go through kind of a separate treatment where you take out some of that dark pigmentation. Uh, otherwise, the characters um, that you need are they're invisible. Um, so you have to kind of you bleach them. You can find uh, all of these species here in Puerto Rico. Uh, no, um, I, I think the, the okay, so the list of known species from Florida is around 75. Um, I can't remember what I put the number down here for Puerto Rico, but it's it's, it's certainly no more than 75, but I think it's more than 50. Um, what you find though um, is that. At any at any one time, there's only really a few species that are extremely abundant, causing problems. 
there are a few species that are always causing problems in certain circumstances, like um, like some of the Bemisia types or some of the spiring white flies. But what we found in Florida by going back and looking at history is that there are some species that will probably never quote a problem. They were always part of the natural background. They all had their place. And then, but as we acquired new species um, over time, they went through a, a period where they were very abundant, a major pest. And then for whatever set of reasons, they just declined and they go back into the background. So it's, it's sort of like an evolving situation. Um, as, as more species move around, some become incredible pests for a while, and then they kind of decline over time. So but I would guess that there's probably, um, in total, you know, probably less than a dozen species right now in Puerto Rico that are going to be found in any significant numbers in a given circumstance. There may be several dozen more that you have to go specifically to find for a very particular circumstance, but probably less than a dozen that are going to be in any manner uh, uh, abundant. And they, so they are more abundant, more abundant in lowlands, in like high altitudes? Um, for, for situations like, um, say, for the elevation range in say, Puerto Rico, I don't think that would have any impact, except to the extent that it changes the plant community structure. Um, there's no there's no white fly without a plant that it's on. Um, so if the plant is either you can either cultivate it or it naturally occurs um, in this um, sort of uh, climate zone or in, in this uh, sort of ecosystem setting. Then the white fly can be there, um, but at the global scale around the world, it makes a huge impact. Um, the again, the genus uh, Eleutherus, it's a tropical genus, um, subtropical for some species. Um, when we found our first one in Florida in the 60s, uh, it got about as far as North Florida on certain plants, and it didn't go any further north. Okay. It had no hosts. It couldn't withstand the seasonal changes in temperature because um, it's a tropically adapted species, and many of them are. Um, so at the global scale, yeah, the, 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 the biogeography matters a great deal to the possible distribution of a white fly. So I just want to have a quick word about this, if it's OK. Um, this, for the people that are going to be joining us on doing laboratory work, this is an updated version of, of, the, of, of um, what I had sent to say originally. Primarily what it includes is um, some enhancements in our ability to identify the spiny white flies that we encounter. Um, the existing resources are, are a little challenging to work with, and I've tried to improve upon that. Um, uh, specifically for the ones that we're going to tackle uh, in the lab. Um, I also have another one that I didn't print out because it's not in a suitable format, but it's a consolidation of the literature for the spiraling white flies. We can use that as well. Good. Good. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you.